Welcome again, everyone, to the philosophy of art and science. Our special guest today is Illuminati Congo, aka John the Baptist. Welcome to the program. Oh, thank you. Thank you, brother. It's such a joy to finally converse with you face to face in this way. Uh, you you've uh, inspired me in many ways, and uh, I, I love your insights into language and into Ethiopia and uh, and 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 oh, your overall holistic uh, approach to to life. So it's a joy to converse with you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, I I I noticed that. Um, I don't remember exactly how we found each other, but I know it was on X, the medium formerly known as Twitter. And we seem to both be eclectic people that aren't bound. And I, I kind of want to get into that by by starting off with the names. I think names are important in culture and everything. Um, how did you all come up with the name Illuminati Congo? Because I'll tell you off the bat what stuck out to me, especially when you cut the Illumin out and just have Natty, you always hear about Natty Dreads and like natural hair and that movement. Oh, and I didn't know if that had anything to do with it. Yeah, it's it's Rasta to the core for sure, uh, and it's Nati Congo. You know the 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 thick dreadlocks, the the natural liberty, and and really bringing that uh, because a lot of people are afraid of the word Illuminati. Mm -hmm. and, uh, while there may be people who have uh, ill intentions for for others, and 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 they may form in groups. I don't know that. Uh, presently that they're called Illuminati and, and really like Illuminati was was originally a name of uh, newly baptized Christians uh, in uh, in certain regions and uh, illuminated manuscripts. Uh, these things are are sacred. Uh, so illumination is sacred. So I, I wanted to return it to its rightful place to sort of help uh, dissolve the fear around that name. See, yeah, that's powerful. And um, it goes along with a very biblical teaching that I mention as often as I can. Uh, I mess with kids sometimes who hear scripture and I tell them, is a snake good or bad? And they always say bad. And I say, you got to watch out because in scripture, the devil is represented by a snake, but so is Jesus in, in the gospel of John and in numbers, he's a snake on a stick. And there's other snakes on the sticks that are not so good. There's there's hills that are like that too. There's hills to worship God, hills that you don't worship God. Even the lion. Uh, there's a line uh, in Peter that says the the devil is like a lion going around to devour yeah. you, but yeah. he's also the conquering lion of the tribe of Judah. Yeah. So it's um it's very functional the way you've taken it back. And even today, you mentioned the illuminated manuscripts like we have at the Garima Gadam. I have a friend, uh, Deacon Bazin, who's actually touched them. He, he visited that monastery. I, I would like that blessing one day. And um, you mentioned the church usage of it too. Um, to this day in the Greek church in English, I have one nearby me that I visit sometimes. They call the baptized Christians, they call them the recently illuminated. So yeah. they still they still use that language. But yeah. but you're right. Some people just think it's a, a, a cabal. I think those people aren't fully... Um, thinking another one of the kind of descriptors you have that i think gets to um i think what you and i share in terms of eclectic i've seen j cole and, and kendrick lamar try to push this as well i think kind of early on but this dichotomy and rap or hip-hop between conscious and unconscious and even in general the conscious community lamert park if you ever been out here in la is, is like that i'm sure there's a shy town uh, equivalent could could you speak on that on on the liminal space between conscious and unconscious that you occupy yeah well well first and foremost like if you are conscious uh whatever that means but if you're if you're present and uh aware uh and or thriving for greater awareness uh i think that anything you listen to can can be a, a conscious uh, expression for you. So so for me, and everything is conscious rap, even the most ignorant uh, statements, because there's still uh, a meeting place where where you can consider something valuable from that. You can extract something valuable from it. There wouldn't be people listening to it, first of all, if there wasn't some 
something that was attracting them. So just even understanding that uh, you can extract that value from it. So I, I uh, appreciate the full spectrum of things, but then uh, attempting to balance those things so that people can can receive uh, maybe a, a more uh, nourishing message in the music uh, who wouldn't normally listen to it. You know, I'm, I'm okay at it, but I have some friends that are really great at uh, making that balance between what's, what's super popular and then some words of, uh, of wisdom and, and insight uh, dropped here and there as well. Yeah, like uh, I, I've seen that you've collaborated before, for example, with like Diggable Planets and KRS-One. And these are some of the people that I, I grew up listening to. Yeah. And especially with this one uh, song called Classic, where he collaborated with Rakim and Kanye and Nas. It was, it was interesting how Kanye snuck himself into that back in the day. But he, he had this line about how... Um, MCs, I think I'm going to butcher the line, but uh, MCs uplift their people. And he said uh, rappers are just kind of more self-oriented. So he's kind of even more in one camp. So I don't know if you're saying you lean more conscious, if anything, but you do try to balance the scales. Yeah. Uh, what I, my mind has always been like just centered around God, natural liberty. When I say always, I mean, since I was a, a little guy in high school mm -hmm. and even before that uh and so that just goes into my music and i i can't get away from it i've tried to dumb it down before i've tried to, <laughs> to make the feel and it's just it doesn't work uh for me at all so really just finding that there is a place where i can do what i do and it serves people uh and and be uh served as well through sharing it has been has been what I found. But uh, I do attempt uh, here and there. I, like I have thing, uh, a couple songs coming out with RZA uh, soon as well. Amazing. Those. Oh my God. The whole Afro Samurai soundtrack was like, you know, him, obviously Wu-Tang. And, and that was my favorite like anime. Probably growing up, it was a short mini series. Everything he did, even when he was on Chappelle's show, yeah, 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 it, and they're just produced by him. He's not rapping, you know. It's mm -hmm. just those, those kind of productions. <laughs> yeah, that's his main. That's his main thing, anyway. That was what he was doing. Is the mind his his rapping was almost secondary to the production. For sure, for sure. Um, yeah, and and to to delve deeper into these um, what appear to be you know binaries or dichotomies to people, but things that you you blend together. You also have experience in yoga. By the way, I've never done Kundalini, but I've done different uh, power classes. And I was actually first introduced to yoga back in 2010 via Beachbody, of all places, from uh, Tony Horton's P90X program. Yeah. And so he had a version of kind of uh, power yoga. Um, more recently, I had uh, come across Sadhguru and his the Hatha yoga, the, the classic kind of uh, asanas or postures that he's been pushing but but you talk about yoga but then also the hood and the hood isn't always known for yoga but i have seen more and more i have a couple of black friends in la who are uh one who's not as public but um who who do promote and one who was on the podcast he was a yogi actually and he teaches it in schools as well but who do try to make those type of efforts can you talk about the hood and yoga and whatever intersections of, are, are there because those are different audiences and i appreciate that yeah. Yeah, well, what's what's really interesting is that a lot of the symbols of the hood come straight out of yoga. So in, in Chicago, we have uh, the pitchfork, which, you know, that Shiva and Shakti and Kalima, they, the pitchforks are associated with them. You also have five point stars and six point stars are associated with these gangs. And you can, you can trace that to many different uh, origins. You have gangs that are called uh, the Black Keystones, or uh, uh, which which comes from the the Black Stone in in Mecca, uh, the Kaaba, and 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 also 
they refer to each other as Mo or as Moors. Uh, so you in. I never knew that Mo was short for Moors. That's crazy. Yeah, and in the whole gangster system, even the word gang, you can trace to the word gang, Ganges, Ganges River uh, gang. And the word, the, there's a word called Ganas, where the word Ganapati comes from in Sanskrit. And Ganas are this group of people who like, they make up spontaneous songs to Shiva, they, they get drunk, they dance, they're wild outcast type of people, uh, almost like some underground hip hop type of thing. A cypher, uh, yeah. Yeah, and and so you have you have all these concepts, even the word thug comes from India, th thugati, meaning to cover or to hide or to occult. Uh, so all the word thug itself comes from the yogic culture. Uh, almost everything you take out of the gangster culture comes from uh, some ancient rites or symbols. And so if, if you just take moments to consider what any of those symbols mean, they could be a pathway into finding the divine, finding the one, finding peace uh, or or finding something deeper in your practice. Yeah, that's it, it's it's um it's a very fascinating culture. And I actually just <laughs> uh, I want to say coincidentally, but it, there's no there's no coincidences. I, I happen to be teaching. I just finished um, the, 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 the fall semester, but I've been be teaching a long term substitute assignment and they were learning in sixth grade world history the Indian subcontinent or South Asia, as some people try to call it today. So we're learning about the Ganges River, the Indus River, and they're learning about uh, the Brahman, the Supreme Being, but also the, the Brahman, the classes, the different castes, the Kshatriya, the warriors, and all that stuff. So it's, it's so interesting. Um, and for me, I see it as very distinct, but it, it, the, the fascination and the, the depth with which you've studied this matter You've also caught me off guard with how much you know about the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Now, yeah. obviously, like there's an obvious kind of connection with Rastas, but there are also so many different houses of Rastas. I'm yeah. I'm curious how you first came to to know about the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Well, uh, I first came into the connection with Christ as a, as a little dude uh, when I said, you know, I was thinking about these things and. My dad ended up going to Jamaica. Uh, he came home with some reggae tapes, a book about Rastafari. And I was still in grammar school in a shirt with Bob Marley on it said Rastafari <laughs> on the bottom. Uh, I took his book, was reading through it. I was seeing Haile Selassie, seeing like this God, King, King, Kings, Ethiopia. I didn't really understand what I was reading because I, I was still like in like seventh grade or something. So it's mm -hmm. just like, Huh, I, I didn't get any of it. I'm just thinking about God is one. This is another name for God. This is the way that people are understanding it in Ethiopia. You know, I'm, I'm searching more into what it means to be melanated or black. And so that was some of the roots at that time. Uh, and then I went to a Christian school for my sophomore year, not a Catholic, but a Christian school. And I wore that shirt one day with Bob and it said Rastafari. And it, she came up to me, one of the teachers, and she was like, uh, you, you know, uh, you can't wear that shirt here. That, that, you know what that says on it, don't you? And I said, Rastafari. She said, yeah. Uh, I said, it's another name for God. And she was like, no, it's, it's the name of a cult in Jamaica. And, and that's when I, I, I started to think about stuff. And, you know, began to get, you know, started to see that people were making distinctions of things. And so, you know, I, I, I was praying and it took me, uh, my prayers took me to all around learning about Kemetic, learning about Hebrew Israelite, the Tao, uh, 
Egyptian yoga, uh, Sanskrit yoga, Kundalini style, learning learning so much stuff. Uh, and all of those things sort of still were pointing to price for me. And because of that, it made me see the Ethiopian church as like, if Ethiopia has never been conquered, if it's mentioned in the Bible and in, in the book of Genesis, if it has the ancient forms of Hebrew and the ancient forms of Islam and ancient forms of Christianity, I think maybe there's some wisdom. I want to make sure I'm receiving and, and humble enough to just receive it as, as it is. Uh, and so that's that's what led me to to really just do do what i can to slowly learn and uh because his majesty you know he sent uh one of the uh archbishops or one of the abunas to jamaica for i and i to converse with and to form a communication with and i believe it was to be a two-way street not a one-way street that's what what he did it for but uh even still it has to be a two-way street so rasta we we got to receive the wisdom from kawaii yes that was abuna isaac he's the he was the father confessor of my father confessor Abba thomas finley in los angeles and his legacy is in starting all of the major Ethiopian churches, not only in the Caribbean, past Jamaica, all all the islands in the Caribbean. And I've had some brothers from Trinidad and Tobago on, on my podcast who have been affected by his legacy as well. But also in DC, in New York, in LA, and and all over, his, his legacy is still felt. Um, I saw a few priests who are meeting up with all the different Oriental Orthodox Christians, Egyptians, Syrians, Armenians in uh, the Northeast. And I know that they're they're all the product of and the legacy of Abu Nisak. And I consider myself as someone who's been involved in the English services of the church also to be within that legacy. And someone who's learned a lot from Abba Thomas, who was his his student and, and disciple in that way. And, you know, Abba Thomas is a fully white American who grew up in the Midwest. And he's like uh, in his I think he just turned 80 uh, earlier this year. You know what I mean? So you you know what time frame he's from. But Abu Nisak, uh, it was able to relate to him and was able to re relate to the Rastas and was able to relate to the Ethiopians. So although I say some Ethiopians shunned him, he was he was a great man. I think he'll go down and be canonized as a, a saint one day for sure. Um, but you you didn't just have like you had all of these different esoteric disciplines that you looked into and in, in world religions. You did a, a kind of a serious breadth study. Some people just end up where they where they grew up, but you actually sought and were seeking. And it tells you if you're really seeking after righteousness that you're gonna you're gonna be on the way to finding it. But you didn't just have like a, a cursory glance with the, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. You've come out with a new album, which is something I really want to uh, get down and uh, talk to people uh, with you about. And uh, some people might see my voice on that, uh, one of the tracks there. Uh, it's called um, Mazmur. How did you think of, uh, which of course means Psalms. Uh, how did you think of the title Psalms or Mazmur? And uh, tell me about the, the the thought process behind this album. It's 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 really interesting you know i i was just listening and reading uh psalms a lot and uh just wanting to stay in a state of uh prayer and and inspiration from the wisdom of god and so that's what i like to do with my music is make things that'll help me stay in that focus uh there's so much so much good use usage of the psalms so many ways to use them and for them to enhance our lives uh so i i had a one thing i did uh, in a previous album where i was like be still and know that i am god uh where was you know that's a line from psalms uh and that sort of sparked the idea that, well, why don't I really just give the whole song in some of these things? 
And so I was flying out to my friends uh, out to LA and I have a friend who we do music together uh, pretty, pretty efficiently. It's like boom, 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 boom type of thing. And so when I got on a flight, I started thinking about the songs and the Psalms and I started to transcribe a few of them into rap on the plane. Uh, and then when I got to his home, I was like, yeah, we're going to do an album called Songs. And within 15 hours, all, all of my parts were recorded. It was wow, like just, just the whole album was, and then we got the guests on uh, after that and mix, but the album was pretty much done with so quickly because it was, it felt like it was just, infinite energy supporting what we wanted to do and then my friend who you know he's not as uh his mind is doesn't think how, how i do so he has a connect everyone has their connection to god but i'm always thinking about always talking about he not but when he saw like certain things moving in his life after it was so great to to see how he was like he would call me and be like, yo, you were saying just have faith. It's just this and this is happening. And this, this. <laughs> I was like, uh, it feels like there's some momentum in this. May, I pray that it, it's acceptable uh, in God's sight. And uh, and I was so happy for you to be able to put some official keys on there. Uh, it, it meant a lot to me. Yeah, I hope some get as a uh, uh, <laughs> sage from back home doesn't could they always have something to critique and improve a little bit, you know? I yeah. Uh, even I listen back and I'm like, I think it's pretty close to perfect because I, I it was the first song, and because it's the first song, I've done that one a lot. If you if yeah. you had thrown me to a random chapter, I might have stumbled a little more. Okay. Um, I could get through it, but I might have stumbled a little more. I always tell people. I always say I'm an Amharic expert, but I'm a student of Gittas. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Some people, I share a lot of Gittas online, and so people will get it twisted and think I'm not an expert on Gittas, but I um, I definitely understand the meaning more than uh, pronunciation. My pronunciation is not perfect, but it's, um, it's there, and I do have the recognition of th those people who are experts in, in that field, in that matter. I'm so glad that you invited your friend to participate, and then the blessing is spreading in that way. I don't know if you know this about me. Most people don't, but I was uh, once my fancied myself an MC from about that high school time to uh, to college. I, I did an album one time, a mixtape, in two weeks, and I thought that was ridiculously quick. But you're talking about 15 hours. I've only uh, you know got my feet wet in the game. I've never really been serious about it. So the fact that that you did that so quickly, it has to come off as inspiration. And it was so textual to your point. You said you tried one line of, of, of the Psalms before, but then you started getting uh, deeper and deeper uh, into the quotation, almost to the point where it's like um, in the in the various Christian historic churches, they call them psalmodies. It, it's like your album could be considered a psalmody where it's just the Psalms sung and then they they throw some edits like the cops and stuff will throw and the and the and the Ethiopians as well like in the name of the Father Son and the Holy Spirit which you don't find in the text of of the Psalms but they'll throw stuff like that and and maybe the word Christ that's not in there so it's it's kind of like a remix or an editing sung version of the Psalms and I always tell people we have this Dawit Madgam or this repetition and recitation of Psalms culture in Ethiopia where it kind of gets lost in the West but is very powerful that I think there's no more powerful prayer than the Lord's prayer and the Psalms. And so I always, I'm always telling people, some people just read the Psalms if they do through 150 chapters once and then not never again. But for me, it's something that you need to be singing the rest of your life. So the fact that you have it, I, I access it on Spotify. Are there other places where people could access it? It's on YouTube and uh, Amazon, iTunes, uh, wherever you listen to music, it'll probably be there if if it's not uh, uploading soon. Some places take a while, uh, so the like title, all of that, it, it ought to be there. That's beautiful. So people, and we're plugging it now, we'll plug it again at the end, but that's Illuminati Congo and it's called Psalms. And you see in the, the is letters, the word Mazmur as well, which is what it, 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 by the way, it's, it's a cognate of the Hebrew word, which is Mizmor. In Hebrew, it's Mizmor. In is it's uh, Mazmur. So even someone who knows Hebrew could relate to it on that level. 
I wonder also, obviously you don't have the space in a in an album to do 150, <laughs> 150 tracks. Uh, you had to pick something. You chose Psalms one, two, and three, and uh, you, you did some other songs, and then you did twenty Psalm 23 and, and Psalm 91. Can you talk to me what was going through your head about, you obviously have like a limited amount of tracks you could do. What's the selection process like? Yeah. I. I was like, all right, the album's called Psalms, so let me just give the first one, two, and three. Uh, that's that's sort of where that came from to build that one, two, three momentum up. And I'm so glad I did because that's when I found what I ended up saying at the end of uh, uh, Psalms 3 uh, was that, you know, the word Selah is mentioned three times in psalms three and and then like that being a root sound in the word salasi or salasa which is trinity or 30 uh it just makes me think that you know a lot of times people say that the meaning hasn't been necessarily uh settled upon for for sila or sila mm -hmm. And so I think there may be some type of code or something to consider related to three with that word. So I I, I was happy that we went to three there because it made me consider that. Uh, but then uh, Psalm Psalm twenty three is is a really famous psalm that is strengthening for so many people, uh, and for some reason the the chorus just came out to be God is love on there. And I never really read that song thinking about God is love, but now I do. Uh, every time uh, I see that the way God is there for us, that's that, that's that love. Uh, and Psalm 91 has been feeling really just powerful. I didn't, I don't know. Uh, why I chose it wasn't never my favorite or anything like that. I think maybe I just heard it in a book recently, and then I was like, "All right, I'm I would do that one." <laughs> but it's just been so empowering for me uh, because it feels when I put that one on, I feel like, "Oh yeah, I'm good. I'm good." It, it things may be going wild. God got me. Both of, the, both of the Psalm 23 and 91, both of those are like really comforting songs. It feel like bring the comforter's presence. Absolutely. The, the earlier you get in the book, the more grievances there are and the less praise, but there's always praise. And the later and later you get, it's it's more and more praise. Till you get to like the final Psalm, it's just like all praise. <laughs> no, more, no more complaints, more grievances. And that's kind of what that celestial worship ends up being like so i could see 91 is it's on the way it's it's beyond that halfway point so it's crossed the threshold and then 23 like you said is classic that's it's one of those ones that people often um memorize i think when they are getting into it and and then you end with it i think you were talking about that first discouragement you got was i'm imagining as a sort of evangelical protestant school now was it predominantly white or predominantly black it was uh it was mainly white yeah yeah uh often what i find back from luther who started this and and it it still seeps into their theology even though they not take it as far as luther they have an issue with uh this whole workspace theology i actually had a scholar of this topic on one time matthew thomas it's an episode on the podcast for anyone who's interested to could kind of dive deeper into it but you end it with faith without works, which is and and the implied what people who know the verse is dead, and and it's that verse that they actually hate the most. So it's so funny that that was your early discouragement because that's one of those verses that they hate. Um, Luther thought that the Martin Luther thought that the book of James didn't really have the quote unquote gospel, so he wanted to take that and some other books out. And to this day, they they don't take it that far. They're not gonna say they want to rip a book out of the bible but you could see just by what they emphasize and de-emphasize that they're not the biggest fan of that chapter what does it mean to you that this uh, faith without works it's, our faith has to be lived and 
if if not, maybe it's not even fake. Maybe it's just lip service and just playing around, intellectualizing with things. A absolutely, yeah, yeah, and and lip service is biblical too. That's from Isaiah. It's so funny how the idioms that we use are are all um, rooted in that. So definitely encourage again everybody to search Illuminati Congo and Psalms wherever you listen to music and to keep getting on this point of how eclectic you are, you're also interested in finance and crypto and all of that. Could you could you talk about how you get into that world? Because there's some people who are deep in it and some people who um, are still skeptical. Even recently, I'm, I've been noticing the Bitcoin prices going up and down and, and some people are like, I told you so. And some people are like, no, don't believe yet. Okay. So I'm, wonder, I'm wondering where you are in the uh, crypto space and how you found that. Well, well, first, this is like any alternative to Federal Reserve IMF uh, currency and what they're doing makes sense to me. Now, there could be an argument that uh, these things are still controlled or semi-controlled uh, by that. But once you get deep enough into it, you, you know that code can't be stopped. There's all types of privacy coins and platforms that allow one to to really uh, take control of their own finances. And I see that um, most nations are are like not quality anymore. Uh, I don't know when when they may have been. And I think a new solution is uh, is amongst us. Or it's starting to form in some of these uh, digital uh, financial uh, platforms. And, and there's more than just fi finances involved in these things. There's ID uh, as well, which once again, people might think that leads to further monitoring and control, but there's there's ability to do private uh, IDs or private KYC. Uh, there's there's ability to like Ethiopia was using uh, Cardano, and they they probably still are for transferring uh, educational records uh, through the blockchain. Not not all it's not standardized all across Ethiopia, but it's been implemented in certain. Uh, places so that uh, a student's fine, uh, educational records can stay with them uh, easily because there's problems of not being able to keep these things uh, organized in, in certain places. So there's many ways that crypto technology is being used uh, beneficially from, from what I found. And it's really up to whoever's participating to direct the the ship uh whichever direction we want it to go uh so so that's why i participate because uh financial and economic uh participation if we're if we're living in society we're going to have to participate in finances and we might as well find a way that we can do it in uh that preserves more of our, our rights and privacy. Uh, and, and that is, there is potential for that in the blockchain if you if you really delve deep enough. Absolutely, I've, I've been interested in the space since about 2013. Uh, gentleman Cody Wilson, I've been following a lot, was uh, an Amir Taki. They were very much interested in the kind of political element of it, not just let me get rich quick type of thing like you're saying yeah. and there's some very fierce for example the amhara fano guerrilla fighters shout out to them in ethiopia right now they could they could definitely use this where internet is selectively turned off in ethiopia because of some of the civil war um that's going on right now i know some people go for uh the exchanges some people go for the digital wallets. I'm actually mutuals with Samurai Wallet, so shout out to Samurai Wallet. I get no affiliates from them, but I think they're cool. They're, they're kind of um, the big privacy wallet that I know about today. But then I know I have some friends who've been interested in the hardware stuff with Trezor, 
and obviously if if the state is powerful enough and and strong enough they could strong arm you know swat bust your door down and take even the physical stuff if if it's not super stowed away but do you uh do you generally think of using exchanges or the digital wallets or the physical the physical type of uh hardware that stores it yeah it, it depends on what you're working with generally speaking you want to have your stuff stored away on something physical if you're planning for a long-term hold and to do something with it later but if you're if you're ready to do stuff with it actively on the day day to day you just need to have some a secure uh wallet uh you know a web wallet uh or an app like uh metamask or yep things of that nature will uh, I, you know i have some there's there's a lot of great ones that are better for privacy and then there's some coins you can't even store them in a metamask uh you know you need their own specific wallet for it but i'm i'm usually going with with a wallet that i can store it and easily get it somewhere that i could sell if i need to uh and I've been fairly secure, haven't had any any hacks uh, that way after playing around since 2017. Uh, can we pause one moment? I, I, my battery, had, I got to plug my cord and I apologize. Go ahead. Yeah, that's really good that you're able to see the situation in the context and then figure out what's good for them. I'm so glad that you also said MetaMask because it's funny i was mostly interested just in bitcoin at first i would look at the other stuff but i ended up getting this thing called um urbit which one of my former guests has had which is a way of accessing the internet differently um i'm not the best uh, technically speaking to talk about it but it's like creating your own server and accessing the internet totally uh functionally from a different way and in order to get urbit you have to have Ethereum. And so I had Ethereum and I had to figure out how to pay the gas taxes and all these things that I never was with Ethereum. I was always interested in the idea of Ethereum because of the smart contracts. And I found it um, Vitaly an interesting character in the space, but yeah. I ended up getting MetaMask and getting Ethereum just so I could get onto Urbit. So it was like one thing to get to uh, another. And so it's your point of like the whatever your context is, there are different, solutions that may be right for you exactly. and the other aspect of it is that some people just sort of exchange their federal reserve notes which by the way as an aside that's like another thing that you and i uh, it's so funny that we all have you had you one of your book recommendations is the creature from jekyll island oh, and, yeah. and early on in was it 08 i was reading ron paul's and the fed and so i never got to jekyll uh island but i i'd heard about it and it was in a similar vein as as Ron Paul's and the Fed. And um, I actually worked for Dennis Kucinich, who uh, in 2011, who worked with Ron Paul on trying to get some some legislation started to begin auditing the Federal Reserve Bank. And I worked as a legislative intern back then to try to just try to audit them, not even get to the point of ending them and, and changing this, but just let's, let's just audit them was the basic question that we were trying to get across. And it, it still it hasn't really happened yet but um the the other aspect of it is whether to just exchange your federal reserve notes for these uh various currencies or to begin mining i know you've had a you've had an interest and in, you shared a post recently that had me cracked up because you try to put people on too but it's up to people whether they're going to take you up on that offer or not yeah. can you talk about any efforts you've had to to mine yeah i've, I've mined uh a lot uh well I guess that's comparatively, uh, I don't know how much anybody minds, but <laughs> I've, I have mined Dogecoin and Litecoin and uh, a whole bunch of other coins that you might not have heard of. I mine through driving. Just through driving, I earn coins through a few different ways. One, through mapping the city. Uh, and, you know, Google has a monopoly on that. So imagine if we could roll around wherever we're going and it's just taking pictures the same way google's thing does uh and businesses who need mapping services can go to someone else besides 
uh, Google. Uh, that one has been rocketing, and I I knew it would because I could I knew the people in the team. Uh, they had a good vision. They were working with the right people. They seemed like they were uh, really taking care of people as best as they could. And now the the coin is is rocketing. Uh, there was another really cool one I started mining just because I, it was the first coin I heard that uh, was going to be a neural network for AI that you mine. And as you mine it, it does, it's not just arbitrary work like Bitcoin. When you mine Bitcoin, it's it's producing Bitcoin. So in that way, it's not arbitrary, but that work is doing nothing else other than that. But imagine if the work was going towards an AI learning system, that would make that coin doubly valuable maybe even more so than Bitcoin. So when I heard about that, I'm like, yo, I got to figure out how to do it. And I'm not a computer guy by anything. I'm just like, yo, I'm going to figure some stuff out. And so I was able to mine a few, uh, a good portion. And, and that's like went to the top number one AI coin. So I think that that's one of the best ways if you don't have a lot of money, but you like to learn, you like projects, uh, and you got some computers and internet access, you know, figure out what are the next coins or the next best coins that are just starting up to be mined uh, and and jump on that you may you may find a gem. Absolutely. I remember my sister is not really into the space at all, but she had put me on to I think there was one with the cause of um, like a prisoner defense fund. I think the other one, though, was medical debt. And it was like an app you download and you just mine using the computer power that you have, just normal computer power. And just by leaving it on and mining, you could go towards some causes the same way that you said it. And it kind of blew my mind early on that that there are all these different avenues that you could do all these things with. And um, I appreciate that you've, you've gotten your hands in all these things. I just see... Uh, a great trait openness in you this willingness to to try to play to experiment and to tinker with all of these things and it's something that i try to do as well and it doesn't mean every every avenue you try is going to you know uh, strike gold like during the gold rush but right but just the fact that you're trying these things something is gonna pan out you know that's the hard work and patience that nip hustle used to talk about but um, I, I really appreciate you and thank you for the, the time you've been generous with today. And I want to ask, could you send us out with um, any words of wisdom or, or any 16 bars that are your favorite 16 bars, whether they're yours or someone else's? <laughs> it, it would only be mine if I, if I did that. Uh, <clears throat> uh, let, me, let me see. Uh, well... I'll do, uh, I'm alive now. I'm alive now of this, I'm certain. As long as I keep strengthening my life circuits and removing unconscious death urges, I will go on living eternally healthy and perfect. Let's build, I'm thrilled and filled with bliss. I'm feeling this miracle that we exist. This thing called life ain't gotta be complex. Life ain't a bitch. She my bright goddess. I ain't focused on the afterlife and who got next. The death urge crept in when you got vexed and became unconscious when emotions suppressed, repressed, building up in the stress. Let's let it go. Let it flow, connect the breath. In it with the outer till spirit matter mesh. The body is a beauty, not a worthless bag of flesh. Master the mind, let divine manifest. Vibrate mind state at a higher wavelength. Ascending through the stargate as I gave thanks. Whatever thinker thinks, prove or makes take shape. To die is a grave mistake. Bars, thank you, Illuminati Congo. Thank you, Hinaka. It's been a great pleasure, Bridget.